Hello everyone and welcome to the Spirit Prayer Extension Protocol Guidance session of the Proteus Consortium. My name is Mel Calvert and I'm a Professor of Outcomes Methodology and Director of the Centre for Patient Reported Outcomes Research at the University of Birmingham and I'm privileged to be presenting this session today with my colleague Professor Madeline King. Oh, hi everyone, I'm Madeline King and I'm a Professor Emerita at the Quality of, of Quality of Life Research and patient reported outcome science at the University of Sydney in Australia. Thank you for your interest in the Proteus Consortium. This consortium aims to optimize the use of patient reported outcomes to ensure that the patient's perspective is effectively captured and can be used to inform clinical trials and practice. Proteus was initially funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute or PCORI and has continuing funding with Genentech. Proteus stands for Patient Reported Outcome Tools, Engaging Users and Stakeholders. The materials we'll present today, along with other resources at the consortium, can be found on the Proteus website shown at the bottom of this slide, the proteusconsortium.org. This presentation is one of a series produced by Proteus and they describe and explain the tools and resources that are available to optimize the use of patient reported outcomes in clinical trials. The Proteus Consortium aims to achieve this optimization by promoting best practices across the continuum of the clinical trials lifecycle as shown here, including optimizing the trial protocol res with respect to its patient reported outcomes, selecting the appropriate pro measure or questionnaire, conducting statistical analysis that is appropriate for the trial's pero-specific objectives, reporting and displaying the trial results appropriately, and communicating these results for, for use in clinical practice. In this presentation, as highlighted here in yellow, we provide an overview of consensus-driven guidance about what to include regarding pero endpoints in clinical trial protocols during protocol development. In other presentations, we provide a broad overview of all the Proteus tools, and we also uh, provide a set of advanced presentations that will instruct you on how to apply each of the tools individually. Following the Spirit Pro guidance is the first step towards producing high quality PRO, PRO evidence. Clinical trial protocols are the essential documents that describe the study uh, design and conduct. A protocol should provide sufficient detail to enable the funders, reviewers and ethics committees to appraise the scientific, methodological and ethical rigour of the trial and for the research team to conduct a high quality study. So although trial protocols serve as a foundation for study planning, conduct, reporting and appraisal, they can vary greatly in content and quality. To address this, the SPIRIT um, uh, initiative and where SPIRIT stands for Standard Protocol Items, Recommendations for Interventional Studies, uh, Trials. Uh, the SPIRIT statement was published in 2013. SPIRIT provides an evidence-based list of items recommended for inclusion in trial protocols. I've always thought that the mantra, get it right in the protocol and all else will follow, was a really good one. But I've discovered through experience that it's not quite right. Things can still go wrong if care is not taken during trial conduct, analysis and reporting. But still, getting it right in the protocol is a very good start. So why is the Spirit Pro guidance needed? Well, Professor Calvert will go into this in more detail. And I'll just say briefly here that we developed the Spirit Pro guidance to ensure that the critical aspects of the PRO substudy are included in the full uh, protocol. In turn, that should facilitate successful conduct of the PRO substudy, which in turn should produce high quality PRO data. And what does the Spirit Pro guidance do? It recommends the relevant information or items to include in clinical trial protocols that include PROs as either primary or secondary outcomes. The Spirit Pro Checklist is an extension of the original Spirit Statement published in 2013. The Spirit 2013 Statement provided evidence-based list of recommendations for inclusion in trial protocols, as I said earlier. 
It does not, however, provide specific guidance uh, on protocol content relating to patient reported outcomes or, or PROs, such as health related quality of life and patient reported symptoms. So we went through a rigorous process to develop evidence based PRO specific uh, protocol guidance. And the paper you see on this slide, published in 2018, describes this rigorous process. And it provides the list of PRO specific items as they relate to the original Spirit 2013 items. We subsequently wrote a longer paper that includes examples from real world protocols and longer explanations of why each PRO specific item is important. I think that'll be a very useful um, paper for many of you as well. So full citation details of these papers are provided on the last slide of this presentation. We gratefully acknowledge the members of the executive group that led the development of the PRO guidance and also the members of the wider Spirit Pro Project team who all generously gave their time and expertise, all so essential to the rigorous consensus process that was required for this. We also gratefully acknowledge our collaborators from the International Society of Quality of Life Research Task Force for best practices for PROs in randomized clinical trials protocol checklist. That's quite a mouthful, isn't it? And also the ISACOR members that completed the stakeholder survey. survey. We also thank the institutions that supported this endeavor and some supported it with funding and others supported it with in-kind support. I'll hand over now to Professor Calvert for more on our motivation and process and a discussion of each one of the PRO checklist items. Over to you, Mel. Thank you, Professor King. So as Madeline has highlighted, um, we really do need to ensure that we have high quality uh, collection of PROs in clinical trials. And what we found from a number of systematic reviews over recent years is that sadly, the PRO content of clinical trial protocols can be very poor. Many trialists will say that they're using uh, particular questionnaires at certain time points, but may actually provide very little further information within the protocol. And this is a real challenge because if people don't understand why they're collecting PRO data, for example, the research personnel involved, and if subsequently the patients themselves don't understand why the PRO data is being collected in the trial, then this can lead to high levels of missing data or suboptimal data quality. Subsequently, this may lead to suboptimal reporting. And crucially, this can then limit the data that is available for use by regulators in health technology assessment, in clinical practice guidelines, and crucially for the care of the patients themselves. Personally, I feel it's totally unethical for us to be collecting PRO data in clinical trials if those data aren't subsequently reported to inform the future care of patients. As Madeline said, there's a fantastic resource, the Spirit 2013 guidelines, um, which do provide guidance on the uh, design of clinical trial protocols generally. And I'd definitely look at this as a really useful resource when designing your trial protocol. However, as she's also highlighted, this didn't include PRO specific guidance and hence the real need for the Spirit Pro extension. So the objective of the Spirit Pro extension was to provide international consensus based pro specific protocol guidance. As highlighted, we've used rigorous methods for the development of this involving many international stakeholders and trying to represent the, the views of these broad stakeholder groups, um, including trialists, clinicians, methodologists, patient partners, regulator, those from health technology assessment agencies, journal editors, and funders and industry. So we really did bring together a very broad stakeholder group to ensure that these guidelines really met their needs. Initial work comprised of a systematic review of existing guidelines, which were very disparate and spread across numerous um, journal articles. Uh, hence why it's probably up to this point was challenging for people to know what exact guidance to follow. Um, we also undertook a 
protocol checklist task force review of the items identified with our collaborators within the International Society for Quality of Life Research uh, Task Force. We undertook an international stakeholder survey and two rounds of an international Delphi survey comprising of the stakeholder groups that I've just mentioned. We held an international consensus meeting with 29 individuals, again, broadly representing those stakeholder groups at which we finalized the Spirit Pro extension. During the process we had, uh, the Delphi process, we had a number of rounds of voting, as I've said, where individuals indicated the relative importance of items. Um, and we had specified thresholds at which for inclusion and further details of this can be found in the JAMA paper. So this slide provides an overview of the Spirit Pro protocol guidance, which, as we've said, should be used in conjunction with the Spirit 2013 statement and related extensions. Uh, for example, there's been a recent extension for the use um, in artificial intelligence trials. The Spirit um, Pro extension it comprises five elaborations of the existing Spirit 2013 checklist items as applied to PIROs in RCT protocols. Furthermore, it has 11 new extensions. These are additional pro-specific items recommended for the use in clinical trial protocols where PROs are a primary or important secondary outcome. So let's now talk you through each of these different items. So initially we'll focus on the administrative information and information that can be included in the background and introduction section of your protocol. So the first item, Spirit item 5A, focuses around the roles and responsibilities within the protocol development. So Spirit 2013 stated that the names, affiliations and the roles of protocol contributors should be stated. In the pro elaboration to this, we've noted that you should specify the individual responsible for the PRO content of the trial protocol. And this is really important because it promotes the transparency and accountability of who has inputted to the PRO strategy within that protocol. And it also identifies an appropriate point of contact for resolution of any pro specific queries. We also believe that patient partners should be involved right from the very early stages of um, designing your study. So even in prioritizing the research area for research. And if patient partners have actively contributed to the protocol development, which we believe they should, then we believe it's important to acknowledge uh, their contribution and name them if possible as well within the protocol. So the next item, Spirit Item 6A, is focused on the background and rationale. So the 2013 item is asking us to describe the research question and justification for undertaking the trial, including a summary of relevant studies, um, examining the benefits and harms for each intervention. But the extension item for PROs goes further than this and asks us to focus and describe the PRO specific research question and the rationale for assessment and summarize PRO findings in relevant studies. And this is really important because in a review of uh, studies on, on a UK portfolio that my team um, and indeed Professor King's team reviewed um, a few years ago, we found that actually only 8% of these uh, trials had a clear rationale for assessment. Um, more recently, a paper that we've published um, in JNCI has highlighted that the, the percentage has increased, certainly in an oncology setting, um, but still, nevertheless, there are a large number of trials that simply don't address this point. Why should we be addressing this point? Well, having a clear rationale for assessment really focuses your mind when you're developing the protocol. We need to understand how these data are going to be used, what is the purpose for assessing the PRO in study? Or is it for a regulatory approval? Is it to inform health technology assessment? Are you looking uh, to assess the efficacy of, of the, um, the treatment through collecting the PRO? Or are you looking to assess adverse events? There are an increasing number of PROs that can then look at safety and tolerability reporting. So you need to really think clearly at the start, what is your question? What is it that you're trying to address? And how are these data gonna be used? And that will really focus the mind for the later extension items. 
Crucially, this will also help, as I mentioned earlier, the staff and the patients understand why the PROs are being assessed. So it might help reduce missing data in your study. And even when the PRO is a secondary outcome, having a brief rationale um, is important. Um, it, it could be brief, that might be adequate enough, but I would still really highly recommend having a rationale clearly specified even in a sentence or two within your protocol. So now we move on to item seven, which is objectives, that we clearly need to specify the objectives or hypotheses as stated in Spirit 2013. And specifically, we need to specify the PRO objectives or hypotheses, including any relevant PRO concepts or domains. Pre-specifying the objectives and hypotheses encourages identification of the key PRO domains and the time points. And this will help reduce the risk of multiple statistical testing and selective reporting of results. We know that in trials, we're collecting PRO data often at multiple time points instruments you can often look at the overall score or subdomain scores so really being very clear about what your objective is whether you're looking at overall score at a certain time point um, is really crucial to avoid this issue of multiple statistical testing so now let's move on to the next section of the protocol the methods and consider the issues around participants interventions and outcomes Spirit item 10 is focused on eligibility criteria. And in Spirit 2013, uh, the item recommended inclusion and exclusion criteria for participants being stated. And if applicable, eligibility criteria for study centers and individuals who will perform the interventions also being described. Now, this is a, a Spirit Pro Extension item where we believe that you should specify any pro specific eligibility criteria. So this might include language or reading requirements or pre-randomization completion of PROs. Now, a further um, point to this is that if PROs will not be collected in the entire study sample, that you should also provide a rationale and describe the method for obtaining subsample in whom you are going to be collecting your PRO data. So what's the reason for this? Well, in some trials, Sadly, it might not be possible to collect PROs in the entire population. And this may occur if you don't have, uh, for example, questionnaires validated in the population of interest. I think this is a, an important problem that as trialists um, and as international stakeholders, we need to address to, to make our trials as inclusive as possible. Um, and actually thinking about this at an early stage in your trial design might allow you to undertake translations and cultural validations using appropriate methods. Um, but however, as, as I recognise, sometimes this isn't possible. And if this is the case, this needs to be specified in your eligibility criteria. And the point around not collecting uh, the PROs in the entire study sample, well, this might be the case if uh, you have a large trial uh, where you might have sufficient power, uh, which will be achieved by collecting PROs for a representative subset of the population. Um, but as we said, if that's the case, you need to really clearly specify how this subsample from the trial population will be established. OK, so now we're going to look at spirit item 12 focused on outcomes. Spirit 2013 stated that the primary, secondary and other outcomes, including the specific measurement variable analysis metric, method of aggregation and time point for each outcome should be specified. Explanation of the clinical relevance of the chosen efficacy and harm outcomes is strongly recommended. Here we have a spirit extension, which states that you should specify the pro concepts and domains used to evaluate the intervention. For example, are you interested in the overall quality of life score, a specific domain or a specific symptom? And for each of these, you should clearly specify the analysis metric. So examples would be change from baseline, the final value, time to event, and crucially, the principal time point or period of interest. These outcomes should clearly align with the trials objectives and hypotheses. And because we can analyze these data at numerous time points, and often you can look at the overall score or a subdomain score, it's really important that we clearly define 
not only the actual metric, but also the time point of interest to reduce the risk of multiple statistical testing. So now let's turn to Spirit item 13, the participant timeline. So Spirit 2013 stated that time schedule of enrolment and interventions and any run-ins and assessments and visits for participants should be stated. And they recommended that a schematic diagram uh, is included. The Spirit Pro extension uh, states that you should include a schedule of pro assessments and rationale for the time points, justifying if the initial assessment is not pre-randomization. Personally, I find it really helpful to discuss this with the clinical team and to draw out what you expect um, the PRO uh, score to do over time, any changes that you would anticipate over time, and help use that discussion with the clinical team and patient partners to help work out what is the optimal schedule for assessments. You should also specify the time windows and where the PRO is collected prior to, uh, collected prior to clinical assessments and if using multiple questionnaires, whether the order of the administration will be standardized. Having a clear schedule of assessments will again assist staff and may help produce missing data. If you collect your PRO pre-randomization, it will help ensure unbiased baseline assessment. And we'd recommend this in the majority of trials. And if you include this as an eligibility criteria, it might ensure data completeness. Time windows also ensure that PROs are captured the effect of the clinical events of interest. Um, so it's really important to think about not only about the time point for assessment, but also the time, the clinically relevant time window around that assessment and to specify that in your protocol. So Spirit Item 14 is focused on sample size. And Spirit 2013 states that the estimated number of participants needed to achieve study objectives and how it was determined, including the clinical and statistical assumptions supporting sample size calculations should be stated. The PRO elaboration to this is that where a PRO is the primary endpoint, you should state the required sample size and how it was determined. And recruitment target accounted, accounting for any expected loss to follow up. If the sample size is not established based on the PRO endpoint, then you should discuss the power of the principal pro analyses. Now, in terms of the explanation for this, um, as with all primary outcomes, um, that's what you would usually base your sample size for your study on. So if the PROs are the primary, um, you need to ideally specify the criteria for clinical significance, for example, minimally important difference if known. But even if the PROs are a secondary outcome in your study, then it's useful to specify whether the sample size that you're planning provides sufficient power to test the principal PRO hypotheses. So now let's turn to further um, methods, particularly focusing now on data collection, management and analysis. So here we're going to now look at Spirit Item 18A, focused on data collection methods. So the Spirit 2013 statement stated that plans for assessment and collection of outcome baseline and other trial data, including any related processes to promote data of quality and a description of study instruments, along with their reliability and validity should be specified if known. And reference to where data collection forms can be found if not in the protocol. There are four PRO extensions relating to this particular Spirit 2013 item, which I'm now going to describe in more detail to you. The first of these, Spirit Item 18A1, um, just is that you should justify the PRO instrument, describe the domains, the number of items, recall period, instrument scaling and scoring, for example, the range and direction of scores indicating a good and poor outcome. Also evidence of the pro instrument measurement properties, interpretation guidelines, and patient acceptability and burden should be cited if available, ideally in the population of interest. You should also state whether the measure will be used in accordance with any user manual and specify any just, and justify any deviations if planned. 
Now, the selection of PRO questionnaires requires really careful consideration. There are, there are hundreds, of hundreds of measures that are now available for you to choose from. So looking carefully at the psychometric properties, um, but also thinking about patient acceptability and burden is really crucial in selecting the right questionnaire for your study. And questionnaires should be used in accordance with any existing user manuals to make sure that the uh, data quality and um, standardised scoring is met. Uh, so if you do plan to deviate, you really should specify this within your study protocol. So we now turn to the second item relating to Spirit 18A. This is another pro extension, which is focused on including um, a data collection plan outlining the permitted modes of administration, for example, paper, telephone, electronic or other, and the setting, whether it's in the clinic, the participant's own home, a combination or other. The reason for this is it's really important that the research personnel and all the also the trial participants know how, when and where the PRO data are going to be collected. So for the trial participant, this information should also be included in the participant information sheet. And the setting for the PRO data collection should be described and standardised across trial intervention groups and sites. Now, it may be that you need to consider using multiple modes of administration, for example, electronic modes, but possibly with the backup of paper based or telephone uh, interview options. And again, this should be clearly specified in the protocol. It's also useful to uh, detail uh, what will happen if, if you can't, if participants don't have access to electronic devices, whether they will be provisioned with uh, devices during the trial. Now, if electronic PRO measures contain any minor modifications with respect to paper-based versions, usability testing and cognitive debriefing may provide sufficient evidence of equivalence within your study. And again, it's, it's good practice to detail all of these aspects within this particular extension item within your protocol. The third spirit uh, 18A extension is to specify whether more than one language version will be used and state whether translated versions have been developed using currently recommended methods. Um, as I mentioned earlier in, in regards to the eligibility criteria, um, trials involving participants with different languages require measures that have been translated and culturally adapted where needed using appropriate methodology. Um, over my years working in pro research, a number of colleagues have over time said to me, oh, I speak a particular language and I'm very happy to just quickly translate this questionnaire for you. But it's really important to note that that is not an accepted approach, that actually you need to follow a very precise methodology. Um, and there's an excellent ISPOR task force paper which describes this, um, where you undertake forward and backward translations and cultural validity work. Um, so thinking about this early in your trial design, um, perhaps trying to capture information um, around what languages are going to be needed for your trial and thinking about costing this into your grant if possible, or doing translation work using it either yourselves following the guidance or using a, a provider um, experienced in doing this is, is really important to try and promote the um, inclusion of participants from diverse backgrounds in trials and also ensure that your results are um, generalizable to the population of interest. So we now turn to spirit item 18A, the fourth item in this series, um, when the trial context requires someone other than the trial participant to answer on their behalf, you need to state and justify this. And this is what we would call a proxy reported outcome. And you need to provide and cite evidence of the validity of the proxy assessment if it's available. And I think it's important to note that this might not always be available, um, but if it is, you should cite it. So why might we need to undertake proxy assessment? Well, in some contexts, for example, trials involving young children or cognitively impaired participants or potentially in palliative care trials, it may be necessary for someone other than the trial participant to respond on that participant's behalf. What you need to do is clearly justify and specify um, the proxy reporting in the protocol um, and 
This will allow external reviewers to assess potential bias and will also facilitate trial reporting in accordance with Consort Pro. You might also want to consider a period where both the proxy and the participant are completing the measure at the same time to help um, assess the levels of potential bias that may be incurred. So I'm now going to hand back over to Professor King to take us through the remaining items. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Calvert. Um, I'm now turning to spirit item 18B, which continues with data collection methods, but now focusing on uh, plans for the assessment and collection of uh, outcome data, um, particularly in related to processes that promote data quality, um, and also the description of study instruments, for example, questionnaires. Um, also, um, the, the, it's important to note here that uh, you need to refer to where data collection forms can be found if they're not in the protocol. So all of these things apply to PROs and there are in there is one specific extension and one elaboration in the Spirit Pro that I will now describe to you. The extension is around management strategies for minimising avoidable missing data. Um, now, missing data are a particular problem for PROs. This is because participants who have the poorest outcomes are often also those who don't complete their planned PRO assessments. So there's huge potential here for bias in data. Imagine if this uh, happens uh, unequally in two, in the two trial arms. Uh, in one of the interventions actually um, uh, leads to early disease progression and death and therefore you get a lot more missing data but the sicker people are gone and so it looks like that trial arm uh, is actually doing better than the other one. These are the sorts of difficulties that you can come into with missing PRO data, which is why you've got to be so careful. Now, PRO data are unlike many other types of trial outcome data because they, the, the information cannot be obtained retrospectively from clinical charts. So um, that means that we need to plan ahead for um, minimising uh, avoidable missing data. Now, not all PRO data are, uh, uh, that, that are missing are avoidable <laughs> um, because patients have the right to decide not to complete their questionnaires. But uh, this is a very complex topic, uh, which I can't possibly do justice to in this presentation. At the end of the uh, presentation, we have some uh, suggested readings and there's one particular paper there that is particularly good on this. I'll draw your attention to that when we get there. So the second um, elaboration on, on uh, spirit item 18b is around the process of PRO assessment for participants who discontinue or deviate from their assigned intervention protocol. Now, it's a bit complicated here because we're using the word protocol here to mean just that little section of the trial protocol that talks about what is the treatment protocol. Um, so we're talking specifically about when a patient is assigned to an intervention, what are the particular things, you know, what are the doses, uh, when are the doses to be had and so forth. So the reason why this is really important for PROs is that um, sometimes when, a, well, I'll give you an example from cancer, which is what I'm familiar with. So a patient, um, often our, the treatments that we give patients are quite toxic. And um, certain patients may have quite an extreme toxic reaction and it's no longer safe to keep them on the treatment. So we would um, uh, perhaps reduce the dose, uh, which, which would be to deviate from their assigned intervention, or we would discontinue completely. Now, once we've discontinued um, the trial intervention, then uh, the patient may be put on to, it would be, would be unethical not to give the, the patient some treatment which is off trial treatment. Um, if you continue to, com complete, to com uh, complete PROs at that stage, you're going to really muddy the waters uh, in terms of a comparison of the two treatment arms. 
So it's really, really important to address this. This is this is one of the items that is 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 very often not addressed and th thought about um, in trial development. So it's important one to note. And by by having a plan and ensuring it's in the protocol, that means that staff at all different sites will collect all the required PRO data in a standardised and timely way, and they will stop collecting PRO data at the point at which the, uh, that patient can no longer contribute data that is relevant to assessing the trial's object PRO objectives. Um, as the example I've, I've given you would um, illustrates, this also helps to minimise bias. And given that participants discontinuing or deviating from their treatment um, protocol is clearly of uh, great interest uh, to, the, to the patient themselves, um, then being clear on this point will help ethics committees uh, appraise um, this aspect of the study. Moving now on to spirit item 20A, which is about statistical methods. And this one, um, the spirit 2013 statement talks about um, being able to, being, being um, required to specify your statistical methods for analyzing your primary and secondary outcomes. And it may not be appropriate to put all of this detail in the protocol. In fact, it, it, it may um, quite often, be, uh, you know, determining the full statistical methods is quite a lengthy uh, a process. And often um, uh, protocol developers are keen to, to get ethics approval and get the trial uh, moving without waiting for the statistician to develop this um, the full statistical analysis plan. but that, And that's fine, but you just need to at least give some sort of summary in, uh, in the protocol and refer to where other details can be found. Typically, this will be in the statistical analysis plan. So the PRO elaboration uh, states that the PRO analysis methods need to be included. And it highlights in particular, the need to address multiplicity or type one or alpha error. Now this multiplicity arises because PRO questionnaires often include several different domains and scores. In addition to that, we typically assess at multiple time points. So this leads to very complex um, set of uh, analyses and hypotheses. And that's why we talk about multiple hypothesis testing or just for short multiplicity. And this multiplicity in turn inflates the probability of false positive results or a type one error or, a, or an alpha error. Now, as we've noted in um, item 12, um, pre-specifying the key PRO domains and time points actually helps with this. So you can see how um, this checklist actually helps, to, helps in thinking and planning and putting all of your ducks in a row. So um, as I've said, um, if the protocol doesn't uh, fully address this, then refer to details where, these, um, where this uh, information can be found. Now, um, a second um, angle on statistical methods arises with spirit item 20C. Uh, this one is about, uh, in the spirit 2013, uh, the general issue is around analysis relating to protocol non-adherence and methods for handling uh, missing data. So there are some very uh, special considerations for PROs. And so the elaboration says, state how missing data will be described and outline the methods for handling missing data or missing items or entire assessments. Now, there's a, to, those two parts refer to the two levels of missing data. First of all, you can have some items or questions in a questionnaire that are missed. Now, how those are de dealt with um, are usually specified in the, uh, in the instrument scoring algorithm. Um, commonly, they're, they're imputed based on the um, number of items completed, as long as at least half of the items in the scale have been completed. However, you really need to go to the instrument scoring algorithm for this. The second type of missing data is actually much more important. That's where an entire PRO assessment has been missed. And I referred to this earlier. This is, it's quite often the case that this type of missing data comes from patients who are sicker. 
So um, the statistical uh, analysis uh, that you uh, use will come with assumptions about this missing data, the missingness mechanism. And you need to ensure that the, the, the missing data mechanism that you observe in your data is actually consistent with the assumptions of your statistical analysis and modeling. This gets back to the point of describing your missing data. So what are the patterns of missing data? Um, there's quite a lot in that. And uh, again, it's another very big topic, but you can read more about it in the uh, Spirit Pro elaboration and explanation paper. And I'll highlight that uh, on the last slide. So now we come to uh, another spirit um, section, which is still in the methods, but this is monitoring. And the spirit 2013 item uh, talks about planning, uh, being, needing to, to plan and to specify your plans for collecting, assessing, reporting and managing uh, adverse events and other unintended effects of trial interventions or trial conduct. Now, PROs have a very special um, aspect when it comes to this, because patients are actually reporting um, on, in many cases, their symptoms, symptoms such as pain, and also psychological aspects such as anxiety. And it may be the case that those data will be monitored during the study to inform the clinical care of trial participants. Now, admittedly, this has not really happened much in the past, but I think moving forward, this is something that might be done more and more. Um, it's, this is an item that is very rarely uh, addressed in clinical trials protocols historically. But again, there is going to be increasing uh, expectation that it, from ethical review committees that it should be addressed explicitly. So, of course, you don't, um, this doesn't mandate that you must monitor uh, the PROs to inform the clinical care of the trial participants, but it does uh, mandate that you need to say whether or not you are doing that. And if you are, then how any um, worrying PRO uh, data will be managed in a standardised way. Also, obviously, this needs to be described to part to potential trial participants. Um, so should be, for example, in the uh, participant information sheet and consent form. Now, just by way of explanation, um, the monitoring of PRO data in a trial may be there to protect participant safety. Uh, things such as psychological distress or physical symptoms um, that are at, at worrying levels may require an immediate response. And these are called PRO alerts. And it follows that like everything else in our trial, we need to minimize, uh, we need to standardize that in order to minimize potential bias. Now this is something that um, I've done um, some qualitative work uh, with uh, trial coordinators. And also there's, there's uh, other work from um, my team members and others that has been published about this. This is, something because it's not addressed often in clinical trials, it is a source of um, some concern and to um, trial coordinators because they don't know um, what they should be doing. That then leads to variation in what's done, which is definitely not what you want in a clinical trial. Uh, the final point here is that um, even if you're not going to be monitoring, um, monitoring this data, uh, you could provide um, alternative support mechanisms for patients, um, such as, you know, a helpline for psychological distress. Okay, well, that finishes uh, the Spirit Pro items. So let's now uh, think about the implications of using this guidance. And you can see here that we have multiple benefits across different user groups. Understanding and following the checklist will encourage and assist protocol writers to plan uh, the PRO components of their trials. And that in turn will improve the PRO trial design. Thinking about protocol reviewers, such as ethics committee members and patient partners, 
Now, this will help them to understand and assess the PRO elements. When it comes to um, the trial uh, staff and participants, having all of the relevant information in a protocol helps them understand the rationale for the PRO assessment. And once they understand that, that might actually um, encourage um, completion of questionnaires in a timely fashion, which will improve the data, uh, PRO data completeness. And being clear on the standardized procedures for all aspects of the, the, the PRO methodology should improve the PRO data quality. So all of this in turn facilitates high quality analysis and reporting and ultimately improves the quality of the um, PRO evidence base. So just to recap, the SPIRIT Pro checklist is needed because the PRO contents of protocols is often incomplete and inconsistent. We know that from evidence and systematic reviews that we've done, and you can read about these uh, in the suggested readings. SPIRIT Pro is designed to be used as a supplement to the general SPIRIT 2013 guidelines, as Professor Calvert and I have emphasized throughout this presentation. The SPIRIT Pro guidance recommends 16 PRO specific items that should be included. And these are a minimum standard. They, these are the absolutes that need to be uh, included for all randomized control trials that include PROs as either a primary or even a secondary uh, outcome. So please keep this in mind because it, it, it's most common that they are secondary outcomes, but this all is relevant to them. It's all about standardizing the key procedures and information. So if we use this checklist, that'll ensure that critical aspects of the PROs um, are included in the protocol. And this is the first and critical step towards producing high quality PRO data and evidence. But it's one thing to have a checklist and it's another thing to use it. So implementation is absolutely the key. So I really hope that you're able to put into um, practice what you've learned from this presentation. And by following the Spirit Pro recommendations, we can improve the quality and completeness of PRO contents in protocols. Here's the further reading that I mentioned earlier on. Um, the first paper is the um, Spirit Pro explanation and elaboration paper that I've referred to. It provides further information to promote your understanding and facilitate uptake, uh, uptake of the recommended items. For each item, we provide detailed description, one or more examples from existing trial protocols and other supporting empirical evidence about the um, uh, item's importance. This paper also includes a protocol template that covers all the Spirit Pro Extension um, checklist items. So that might be a re really useful resource for you as well. Um, as uh, Mel and I have emphasized, we recommend that you use this paper and the other Spirit Pro paper that we've introduced earlier um, in, in alongside the Spirit 2013 statement. And so the second and third references here will, will guide you to what that statement is uh, if you're not familiar with it. And even if you are familiar with it, it always helps to have a checklist. It just makes uh, protocol development so much more efficient. The fourth paper is a companion paper to the first, and it provides tools to support the involvement of patient partners in the development of clinical trial protocols. And I know this is uh, a topic that, um, uh, Professor Calvert is, is very passionate about and uh, I think is going to be of increasing uh, interest and importance moving forward as patient partners become more involved in trials. The fifth paper provides um, uh, greater detail on patient reported outcome alerts. And uh, the sixth paper provides a comprehensive set of strategies to reduce the instance and impact of missing PRO data. This is a systematic review that I referred to earlier um, when I was saying uh, missing data is a huge topic, uh, but there's a lot that you can do about it, um, uh, as it says in the design, implementation and reporting. 
right across the, the trial's uh, life cycle. Uh, the final um, suggestion there is the FDA guidance, which provides an authoritative co coverage of many of the principles needed for high quality PRO research. So we hope you've found this presentation interesting and informative, and we wish you well in your future research efforts. Now, thank you so much for your time and attention. <laughs>